What's up, Lover Researchers? It's Kevin. Welcome to part five of our follow along step by step series in creating a UX research project. We're nearing the end of our series, and I hope you've been enjoying it so far and learning a lot in how we create a project and what goes into it. So comment down below what your thoughts are so far. Today, we'll be analyzing the data from our survey and also uh, the qualitative data from our cafe study. If you haven't watched those videos yet, check them out right here or in the description below. By the end of this video, we'll have hopefully answered our original research questions, shown you how to analyze some of this data to come up with insights that we can use for recommendations. In the final video in the series, we'll compile everything we've learned into an industry-ready presentation. If you're looking to uplevel your UX knowledge throughout this project and for the future, check out courses from the Interaction Design Foundation. It's one of the largest resources in the world for design and research. I know some of you have taken their courses. I've used it when I was first getting into UX research. They have tons of courses you could take and earn a certificate for finishing. So again, I thought this would be a perfect resource for you as we come closer to the end of this project. And if you're ready, I'm ready. Let's get it. What I like to do before I do any kind of analysis is to go back to our original research questions. This helps me frame what I'm looking for because that's what our stakeholders care about. Plus it helps me think about the data I expect to see. So our two main questions were, one, which ballot has fewer instances of accidental undervoting for the Senate race? And two, what are some issues that people have when filling in the ballot? Of course, I also let the data speak for itself. Sure, I'm framing some questions, but I'm also open-minded for new insights that might come out of the data. So we did the survey, quantitative data, and we did the CAFE study, which is qualitative data. So let's start with analyzing the survey data. We did a between subjects experiment to compare the completion rate of the Senate race which was the only manipulation we did in our design. So I managed to get 40 responses for each of the ballot. So the total 80 participants, not bad. And remember, we only care about if people voted for a senator. Doesn't matter who they voted for, doesn't matter who they voted for for the commissioner or anything else in the ballot, just the senator, because that was the main issue on the Florida ballot. Remember, if you watch part three, you'll notice that in my Qualtrics survey, I set the hotspots to on and off. And what I'm looking for in the uh, analysis is if both boxes for senator are off, that means they didn't vote for any senator. If you want to take a look at the raw data, I've linked them down below. It's in a CSV file. Go ahead and download it and play around with it if you like. Uh, but I've downloaded the Qualtrics data. It looks like this. This is from the Qualtrics data, okay? so. If you look at it, there's a ton of kind of random things, recipient, like the participant's name and stuff. I don't really care about that. These are the ones I care about. So what I'm going to do, this is just a preference, but I like to take all this and just hide it. Okay. All right. Now this is what I care about. Question one and question two. Let me open it so you can see it. So the senators were Bruce Wayne and Lisa Simpson. So I've labeled this Bruce and Lisa. Uh, and what I'm going to do is essentially format this data okay format the data and I'm just double checking that I have 40 participants which is true it's 43 rows three rows over here and I'm gonna format do, 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 conditional formatting so I'm applying it to this range if it says off equal to off I'm gonna mark it uh, uh, orange that just means <clears throat> that just helps me visualize it better what I'm gonna do now is count how many people had off on both boxes? That means they did not vote for Bruce and they did not vote for Lisa. I'm just gonna do this by eyeball. Like there's one already, two, uh, three, four, five. Okay, so that's five people who did not vote for a senator in the control condition. All right, that's five out of 40. That's about 12%. Okay, we're gonna do the same thing for uh, the treatment. All right, so I did the same thing for the treatment condition, Bruce and Lisa. So again, I'm looking for if both rows are off or both columns are off, that means they didn't vote for it. Um, from the looks of it, our treatment design did better. <laughs> what a surprise, but is it though? How can we tell if what we saw in our sample is representative or just due to chance? That means, if I did this experiment again with all the registered 150 million people uh, in the United States, would we see the same thing? Hmm, I don't know. 
So let's find out by applying something called the chi-squared test. The chi-squared test is used to test if what we saw is just randomly due to chance. So to set up a chi-squared test, you want to create a table of your observed values, create a table of your expected values, and then compare those two and see if there's a significant difference. Your expected value is the ideal situation if there's no problem. I'm not gonna go into too much depth into how to do this in this video, but if you want a video on it, comment down below, kite squared test. And look at this, we got a p-value of 0 0.02. 0 0.02 means what? That's a 2% probability that what we observed is randomly due to chance. That's pretty small, so I would say that's pretty significant. I know it's not the most mind-blowing finding ever, but it does confirm our hypothesis that the original ballot does yield accidental undervoting, because that's the only manip manipulation we did. So now we have the answer to the first question. All right, that was the quantitative data. Now let's look at the qualitative data that we got from the CAFE study. And remember, this is less about how many people, but more about the why. That's the purpose of qualitative studies. But it was pretty clear from the numbers too. <laughs> As for preference, everybody preferred the treatment design. Why? Well, let's find out through affinity diagramming. This way we can categorize the reasons. What I like to do is write each piece of feedback on a post-it note and put them on a wall or something and then rearrange them to find the themes. If you want to see me do this in depth, check out my video in the description where I analyze your feedback on my YouTube channel. So I don't have a huge wall like last time. I'm just going to do it on my desk and I'll share the results with you. A few moments later. So the main themes I found are this. For both ballots, they're generally pretty easy to fill out. Like even if you didn't compare them with each other, they're pretty simple. You just fill in a bubble and vote for who you want. The other thing is they look like any other ballot according to the participants. Uh, the other thing is they're not sure why there needs to be three languages. The main theme for the control design is that when compared with the treatment one, it appeared more cluttered. It was unclear where to start as well. So those are the main uh, takeaways that I got. As for the treatment design, it's the opposite of the control, pretty much. Uh, essentially, there's a clear distinction between the task and the instructions. Uh, almost everyone said this, and it is very clear where you start voting and where the instructions are, okay? Now, what do you do with these themes? It might be tempting to say, oh, well, the treatment did better, so let's move forward with this design, right? Nope. You don't want to say that. These findings are the starting points for the next step in the UX process. Use the positive components to brainstorm broader ideas with your team. Iterate, test to narrow down your solutions, and then repeat. That's the UX process. So rather than saying, let's move forward with the treatment design, what we could recommend instead is let's distinguish the task from the instructions on the ballot and have a clear indication on where to start. Does that make sense? Give informed guidelines through research, but leave it open enough for the designers. So that's it. That's how we analyze the quantitative data and the qualitative data from our study. Now we have quant and qual data, which we can triangulate and form a big picture story. So we're basically finished with the study. Give yourselves a pat on the back coming this far. All we have to do now is compile everything that we've learned so far into a coherent story with our insights and our recommendations. That will be our final video in the series. And guess what? I only spent about 35 bucks for all the participants. That includes the 80 participants for the quant for the survey and the eight participants for the cafe study. All right, my point being is that you can get pretty good data on a budget really quickly. So if anyone ever tells you conducting research too expensive and it takes too long, it's bullshit. <laughs> Thank you again for watching. If you like this video, please smash that like button and subscribe so you don't miss the next video. Comment down below how this project is going for you or if I've inspired you to do another topic, let me know how that's going so far. I post all things UX research related to help you become the most badass UX leader. Mad love, peace.